So then they, they continued sailing, and at the top of the Bahamas chain, they ran into another ship, another Spanish ship, with a pilot named Diego Miruello. Now, Diego Miruello was credited with the original discovery of the Bahamas by chroniclers. Uh, this would have happened before the 1511 map, uh, but the story went that he was slaving in the Bahamas, a storm drove him to the north, there was this great big land, and there were different people there. They were Indians, but not Lucayans. So he did some trade, but then he didn't have a license to take them as slaves, so he didn't. Another Spanish vessel in the Bahamas, not having any luck because they'd been depopulated, said, well, there was that good story about that stuff to the north. Why, why don't we just say we got hit by a storm and were driven there? So they went to the north, claiming a storm drove them, and met these wonderful people, all very friendly. They invited them on board their ship to show them their ship, and they showed them what their ship looked like below decks, and then they closed the hatch and sailed for Santo Domingo. So that spoiled things. That that's, there was a sort of a relation spoiler there between the Indians of Florida and the Spaniards. But he encounters this very same man at the top of the Bahamas chain during his trip. And this was not a good thing. Ponce was not, this was somebody who was like now sticking his, you know, nosing around what he was doing. And he, and, and uh, Miruello essentially started shadowing him. So they departed uh, Grand Bahama with Miruello and company and they started, they sailed to the floor, they were sailing to Florida, but then they changed course. And I think it was because they decided, this guy's just gonna follow us wherever we go. And he's, pro he's either gonna like, try to claim the discovery himself, or worse still, he's gonna be like, oh yeah, I've been here before, this is nothing new. Uh, which you don't want on your voyage of discovery. Uh, there was also the, the, the belief uh, at the time, and, and, and scholars as well think it's possibly true, that this man was working for Diego Columbus, who was keeping tabs on Ponce. Um, so they went back to the Bahamas and they, they were anchored up and got caught. They were windbound for 27 days, uh, which is a long time. And that's a lot of supplies that get consumed. Um, and during the course of that stay, Miruello's ship drug anchor and was wrecked. Now, I don't know, maybe somebody cut his anchor line. On it. But the crew was saved. And I just made that up. I mean, I can see it happening. There's no evidence one way or the other, of course. Um, so now Ponce has four crews that he has to feed, and he's got a cruise that, that's working for somebody else. So what he does is he splits his expedition. He, he, he reorganizes one ship, he loads it up with supplies, and he sends it out with Anton Alaminos as the pilot, and this guy Ortubia, who was the captain of the San Cristobal. Um, and the documents say it was the San Cristobal, which came back. So you're not going to send out a Bergantin on an extended four-month mission, which is what it turned out to be. In any event, Ponce took the remainder of his ships and uh, Miruello's crew back to Puerto Rico, uh, where he arrives on the 14th of October to find that his town of Caparra has been burnt to the ground by the Carib Indians, not once but twice in his absence. And everything is in an uproar. So he waits patiently for the other ship to return. It returns the next year, February 20th, 1514, after being gone for some four months, with the news that uh, they found Bimini, but no fountain of youth, or that's how uh, it's reported by the chroniclers. And at this point, Ponce goes to Spain because he's got this Miruello problem. He, he wants to get he wants his contract basically renewed. He wants to get the, uh, the rights to Florida. So he goes to Spain in 1514. And he meets the king who he hasn't seen for years and years. In fact, it's the first time he's gone back to Spain since arriving in the New World at 19. Um, so he goes to Spain, talks to the king, and he gets his rights to Florida, the settlement rights, all that good stuff. But there's a problem in Puerto Rico. The problem is war and the Indians uh, the Caribe are attacking the island and burning the place down. So he's got to take care of that first. So go take care of that. He was put in charge of a fleet uh, called the Armada Contra Caribes, the, the fleet for, against the Caribs. And he was also made captain general 
of the island of Puerto Rico. It was a military position, not a political appointment, so the king could do it. Because what was happening on the island was the Spaniards were just going out on cavalry raids and attacking the, the Indians and enslaving them. And uh, so the king was not pleased with that practice. And so he, he was given, he was told to stop that practice. He was the only man who could authorize military action on the island. So he gets back to Puerto Rico uh, with his fleet and finds that in his absence, the people have, the Spaniards there have undertaken their own defense, which, you know, kind of makes sense. And so his fleet was organized in such a way that uh, he could not offer the same rate of pay as these other fleets in Puerto Rico. Uh, so nobody wanted to co nobody wanted to work for him, right? Because he couldn't pay as well. So out of his own pocket, he had to essentially take these vessels and attack the Caribs uh, because he, he, he had a royal order, you know, he had to do it. So he, he did that. He took, carried out a number of raids uh, against the Carib Islands um, and, and brought back slaves and, and they were sold at public auction. And then he liquidated the fleet. He's like, I'm done with this, you know, got out of the contract. And then essentially tried to get the island under control. But he still, he wanted to get back to Florida. Um, and so his life got a little more complicated. In 1520, um, his, uh, his wife dies. And at the time, he had four children, a son who was in the Franciscan uh, monastery on Española, where he was getting educated. Uh, he ended up becoming a Franciscan. I don't know if that's what Ponce had in mind, but that's how it worked out. And then he had three daughters, so he married his two eldest daughters to two brothers, the Troche brothers, and the youngest daughter, who was underage, was, the legal, was in the legal custody, I guess, of the eldest sister. And then Ponce organized his trip of settling Florida. And uh, he went to the West Coast, where the gold trinkets lured him. And they landed there, and they tried to set up a settlement, and the locals didn't like them, and they got in a big fight and he was shot in the thigh with an arrow. His nephew uh, was gravely wounded and he died at sea. They essentially, they decided to uh, regroup in Havana, which actually had been founded between the two voyages. And so in Havana, his wound grew worse and infected. And so he decided that he needed to put his estate in order. So he uh, gave power of attorney to one of his men to essentially, or to basically take his ships and all the goods and take them to Mexico. Because at the time, Mexico was just busting open, right? And Cortez was there and the conquest was underway. And actually the Spaniards were pushed very hard and almost losing. And so he wanted to make some money for his children because he knew he was dying. So he set this all up and then he died. And there was an official in Havana who was the uh, Tenedor de Bienes de los Difuntos, or the, the overseer of the goods of the deceased. And they essentially, this guy and his people, essentially took all the property and they took it to Mexico and sold it and pocketed all the money. <laughs> and so his, his heirs were completely defrauded. And that turned into a court case and I've not been able to determine whether they ever got any money out of that or not. But uh, some years later, his son-in-law, uh, one of his son-in-laws came to Havana and his remains were taken back to Puerto Rico um, and they were uh, interred there. Now, uh, one thing I did, yes, I did want to talk about, I got a little ahead of myself, the, the, the 1516 trade is hard to fit in this anywhere, convenient. But when he's back in Puerto Rico as Captain General, he's still engaged in the inter island trade. And what he's doing here, though, is he's, he's importing bread now. Bread and maize, corn, which was used, that was horse fodder, um, and bateas. And so he's importing mine, basically mining equipment. So he's, engaged, he's still mining. He's, he's always mining all the time. Um, so. There you go. That explains why we have an identical bronze statue in front of the cathedral in San Juan, where, in fact, his remains are.
to this day. So uh, there it is, folks. Ponce de Leon, Thank you.